Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, we got a lot of stuff in the news today. First of all, as you know, I have been reporting on the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute data. And last week we talked about the fact that H5N1 is still, can be detected here, uh, that the enterovirus D68 was increasing. And I also mentioned that parainfluenza virus was increasing. And sure enough, one of our viewers wrote me just the other day that they were on a cruise and towards the end of the cruise developed a pneumonia and turns out it was parainfluenza and as she hopefully is doing better. But it points out that likely got it here before entering the cruise. It takes about six or seven days to incubate and then you get sick. So remember it is out there and for those in the risk group, you know, just uh, be careful. Also, it's summer so it's West Nile time. Uh, if you'll recall, West Nile came to North, North Texas in 2002, and it's been here ever since, every year. And in mid-May this year, uh, they collect mosquitoes, and it was first detected in Arlington and Dallas counties in May. And uh, as a result, the uh, public health department goes and sprays those areas. So far, there's not been a case of West Nile actual patient getting sick in Dallas. But last year, there were 18 patients who were infected uh, in Dallas, three in Irving, and one in Grand Prairie. Uh, there were two deaths related to West Nile last year. So far this year, there have been four uh, samples that have tested positive in Dallas County, so we're getting ready for another season. There's also, and this is a little different, we've had one actual case in Harris County. Most uh, patients don't uh, really experience much symptoms, but about 20% do. It's fever, headache, uh, and um, body aches, et cetera, sometimes a rash. About 1% of the cases that are infected actually get a very difficult neuroinvasive disease that usually that's what that causes either death or long-term disability. There's no vaccine, so the best thing to do is be careful about um, mosquito control. And it's a little unusual that we're, we're, we had it in, in South Texas. So uh, it looks like it may be changing its distribution. It's, it's um, Transmitted by uh, Culex uh, mosquitoes, Culex, there are three species in particular that uh, bite humans, uh, and they live in wherever water sort of accumulates. So uh, they, they they live in where there's se uh, effluent from septic tanks or any kind of water in backyards and, and pools uh, that are not moving, uh, and wading pools like for if you have for a little kid and you just leave the water in there, that's really dangerous. Uh, it's usually bad in the summertime, June, July, August, and September, and they also are the same mosquitoes that carry St. Louis uh, encephalitis in Indiana. So what do you do to protect yourself? Well, really just remember that mosquitoes are more active at dusk and dawn. Uh, make sure that you don't have standing water uh, in and around your home, water from, from gutters, for example, or or waters, uh, if you have a spare tire lying around, or wading pools, pet dishes, anything where water can, can accumulate. Mosquitoes, these mosquitoes don't fly very far. They only go for, they can only fly about, you know, a quarter of a mile at most. So it is really local mosquito control that's responsible. So it's, it's that time. Okay, now we move into the little controversial stuff. As you probably know, the select subcommittee of the House on the coronavirus pandemic is, is now subpoenaed and talking to a lot of the scientists that are uh, involved with uh, COVID. And there have been two major COVID theories, one that uh, obviously it had evolved out of nature and the other that it came uh, from a laboratory leak uh, in China. Uh, it's important to sort of figure this out and I'll say right up front, uh, we don't know. Uh, New York Times just ran an article that sort of put in perspective, both points of view, and I thought I'd just kind of review that with you. The reason it's important is if you look at the uh, excess mortality because of COVID over the last three or four years, you can see this real, really dramatic increase in excess mortality. Here we are in the United States. This is factored per million population. You can see we had 3,500 excess deaths per million people. That translates into 350 million or to 1.2 million deaths. So it was really, really bad. But look, there were countries that did better, France, South Korea, Israel, and Singapore. Why did they do better? They had a better public health response and they had more thorough vaccine coverage. We sort of fell into 
<laughs> an okay response. Italy, Brazil, United States, the United Kingdom are cluster up there. South Africa is the worst, but of course we can always count on Russia. That was Russia. Russia had the almost worst ex uh, uh, response, and that's probably because of their public health problems, and also that they had a very ineffective vaccine. You remember Sputnik? We talked about that back in uh, 2001 or so. So I want to go through the, what the arguments are so that you can at least understand what people are arguing about. So what is the case that it, it, it came from nature? And this is, again, an excerpt from the New York Times article, but also some other references. First of all, you know, as you know, COVID is part of this coronavirus family that's named after the spike proteins that stick out along the virus that make it look like a crown. And in recent years, there have been coronaviruses that have come from animals to humans. So if you remember 2002, SARS jumped from civet cats uh, in Asia to humans. In 2012, MERS jumped from camels to people, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, so there's no other previous example of a lab leak. So we have plenty of precedence of nature to uh, an intermediate animal and humans. So in, you know, if you think about historically as doctors were trained, you know, is it, is it when you hear Hoof beats, it's more likely a horse than a zebra. Well, this is the most common thing you would expect. It's, it has jumped in from nature before, and that's what it would do again. Now, if you look at a couple of papers that really trace the early cases, and, and I went over both of these papers in previous videos, but as, as you're trying to think back on the origin of the virus, almost all of the early cases were found near and around the wholesale market, the seafood wholesale market at Wuhan. Uh, and they mapped them out very care carefully. This, uh, this is a map that was shown in that, uh, that I've shown you before from the original article and that was excerpted in the New York Times. This is the Hunan uh, seafood market, and you can see almost all the cases cluster there in, in people who live nearby. And it was also known that that market sold live animals, such as raccoon dogs, that are susceptible to coronaviruses. And then if you look actually inside the market, Shortly after it began uh, to spread and was identified, Chinese scientists swabbed the walls and floors and other surfaces of the Hunan seafood market, and they found 10 positive samples, in, particularly in one stall uh, that w was known to sell raccoon dogs. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of data that's circumstantial that supports that that was the source. Now, what about the lab explanation? It's, it's sort of... The hard to explain why in all the different seafood markets, all the wet markets, did it happen in the same city that has the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So that is, you know, circumstantial evidence, or at least it makes people think, why in, in Wuhan versus another place? Uh, and we all know that the Wuhan lab collected bat spe uh, specimens from all over China. That was what they did, and they studied coronaviruses, and so that was a bit another you know, thing, and we knew that they were involved with engineering viruses, uh, particularly to understand their pathogenesis and potentially find uh, treatments for them. And at least in this New York Times article, they, they said, well, there is no clear infected animal that they found the exact same sequence. So uh, this is a, a table from that article uh, that they show key evidence that is still missing. So one is infected animals uh, found. They said they do that in SARS and MERS, but not in COVID. Well, that's not exactly true. There have been plenty of bats and pangolins found to have similar viruses, but not the exact same sequence. Earliest known uh, cases exposed to live animals. Well, that's true. We don't know about that. Antibody evidence of animals and animal traders being infected. Well, we found, they said yes in SARS and MERS, but no in COVID. But we found the stall, there is a stall that reported having the sequence right there in, in where raccoon dogs were. So that to me is kind of a yes. Ancestral variants of the virus found in animals, and they list that as a no for COVID, but actually both ancestral species from bats and pangolins have been found. So I'm not sure what they really mean by that. And then documented trade of host animals between areas where ba uh, bats carry closely related viruses. Well, as I mentioned, Raccoon dogs are known to carry the virus, and they were found in that training lab. So, I don't know. Uh, the other evidence that they point to for the lab is in recent decades, there have been lab, lab leaks in Britain, the U.S., Germany, Russia, South Korea, and elsewhere, and different diseases, different viruses. 
And, and there was concern even before the pandemic about this particular laboratory in Wuhan that it might have not follow the most rigorous controls. Now, the other thing is China controls a lot of the, the evidence. There's a sense that it would obviously be very damaging to the reputation of China, and they've been very difficult to, uh, they have not been open about the information. So what, what do I think? I, I'll tell you right up front, we don't know, and we'd have to do more science to really trace to figure it out. But I personally think uh, there's more evidence to support that it came out naturally. For one here, here's that same Wuhan, uh, the Hunan seafood market where all the cases are. This is where the Wuhan Institute is. It's across the river and kind of far away, and no cases were there. You'd have to postulate that somebody was sick there and then went and infected everybody in the market. Now, it's possible, but it doesn't look like that from an epi epidemiologic uh, perspective. Also, there was a paper published right in the beginning, 2020 Nature, that showed this virus came from horseshoe bats. Its genome is 96% similar to horseshoe bats found in a, in a, a close uh, province, and remember our own Dr. Uh, Petrosino and his group also pointed out that the virus sequences are very closely related to Malayan pangolins. So these are all the different, this is, it's not important what the numbers are in China, but these are all the different bat varieties of coronaviruses, uh, their RNA polymerases, uh, and that's where Wuhan is. This is the range of pangolins, so they're completely overlapping. People say, well, how, do, how is there an admixture? Well, they overlap in range. And also, there was a paper in 2022 uh, out of the University of, of Würzburg in Germany that showed that uh, the bat sequences were very similar, not only uh, in the spike protein, but also in the spike protein structure. And uh, they pointed out in that paper that, as you recall, just like we've been watching the evolution of the virus, when it evolves in another animal, it also will evolve. And so you wouldn't find the exact same sequence any more than you find the same exact sequence now in a people that was, was the sequence that we got in, Wuhan, in the beginning from Wuhan. And then if you align the spike proteins, actually these are the important receptor binding domains, you can see this is what's in bat, this is what's in pangolin, this is what's in pangolin, this is in human. And you can see over time, there's been an evolution towards the human sequence in, in pangolins. Dr. Petrosino's group actually took the receptor binding domain and showed, pointed out that it was 99% uh, nucleotide uh, identical in pangolins and man, strongly suggesting that the bat virus had jumped into pangolins. Interestingly enough, the sequences next to the spike protein were 99% identical to the bat. So that really sounds like it could have been a recombinant event in a, in a pangolin. So what do we conclude from all this information? <laughs> I know the house isn't going to figure it out. But I will tell you this. Uh, I think that the best evidence from my looking at all this is that the spike protein uh, is a recombinant event in the pangolin. It came from bat. Uh, there's all those swab data from uh, the stalls early on. Uh, and so, the, to me, the best evidence from the science is that it's jumped from nature. The biggest concern I have, and the thing that makes me most wonder if it's a lab leak, is first of all, that fact that it happened in Wuhan, which is really kind of hard to explain. <laughs> That's where the institute is. And the second is the Chinese response. I don't understand that unless they're trying to hide something. You know, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me that they wouldn't be open to trying to figure this out. So what do we conclude and what should we do about it? Well, I think we can say we need a better public health response. I showed you the data for excess deaths. We need to do better as a public health department. And we should improve lab safety. I got no problem with that. We should be much more careful that we don't have lab leaks. So anyway, that's my summary of everything that has to do with the origin of the virus. So I want to conclude today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, Huge shout out to Paul Ling and the Houston Zoo because we finally have developed an mRNA vaccine for elephant endotheliotropic herpes virus. Tess, a 40-year-old Asian elephant, received the vaccine on Tuesday, this past Tuesday. And uh, this was a, a, a vaccine that was um, developed by Dr. Ling and the virologists at Baylor. So we're going to watch Tess closely and good luck with that. But it's great news for Tess and for all elephants. Also, I want to congratulate Dr. Sarah Chloe D. Rienzi, Assistant Professor of Molecular Virology and Microbiology, who received the American Gastroenterologic Association's AGA uh, Pfizer Pilot Research Award. 
And this is a funding award that's given annually uh, by the, 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 the AGA Research Foundation Awards Program. So congratulations uh, to her. Also want to congratulate Dr. Natalia uh, Kalaf, who has been selected in the 2024 class of the National Academy of Biomedicine Scholars in Diagnostic Excellence Program. She's funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, a collaborative pro program uh, with partnership between the Council of Medical Specialty so uh, Societies uh, that offers a part-time ex uh, experience to develop uh, better uh, leaders in the diagnostic field. So congratulations uh, to Dr. Kalaf. She's part of the iQuest program at the DeBakey uh, Medical Center. And finally, of course, Juneteenth was celebrated this past week, marking the day, June 19th, 1865, that enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, were told of their freedom two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. So today, Juneteenth, uh, Juneteenth is an annual commemoration around the country of the end of slavery. Have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.